filling up the other macroeconomists in the room. Hi, Rafit. Very nice to see you. Nice to see Shall you. Shall we get started? Sounds good. All right. So, um, you know, some of us are here as panelists, some are as attendees, some people are on YouTube. Um, and all are welcome. Uh, most of all, Valerie, who I guess uh, you and I have been talking about having your visits for I don't know how many years. Quite and this good. certainly does not count. But, um, you know, it's, it's better than nothing uh, and, a, and a good start to having you here. It's a great pleasure to have Valerie Ramey uh, give a macro seminar today. She's someone I've been looking up to since I began thinking of myself as a macroeconomist. And she really is a applied economist, applied economist. So um, welcome and thank you very much for waking up early to be here. And looking forward to your seminar. It's 90 minutes, as usual, we'll heckle, and hopefully it's going to be lively and pleasant. Okay, well, uh, thanks so much. It's, it's, I, I'm delighted to be here, although I have to say I, I would love to be in Turkey. That's one of my family's favorite countries, and I'm really sad that you can't take me out for dinner afterwards because there, there aren't good Turkish restaurants here, so I have to make my own Turkish food whenever we want it. We owe you one. Okay. <laughs> um, and please ask lots of questions because I, I, there are modules that I can just jettison if I'm running over time and I don't think I'll be running over time because most of the virtual formats have been one hour. So I expanded this some. All right. So uh, this paper was written for the NBR uh, conference and volume on the economics of infrastructure investment. And Jim Paterba and Ed Glazer had a lot of foresight uh, when they organized this project in the NBER and asked a number of people to uh, write papers for it. And there were people writing micro papers, transportation papers and all of those. And I was tasked with writing the macro paper. So uh, the you know, as you probably have already seen, at least in the US, but also around the world, I suspect, uh, there's been renewed interest in infrastructure spending, and particularly actually since 2008 with the global financial crisis. So infrastructure was considered one of the great ways to stimulate the economy. And uh, so the Obama stimulus, uh, known as the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARA for short, uh, looked for shovel-ready projects in order to uh, invest in infrastructure and stimulate the economy at the same time during the Great Recession. But even beyond that, there's been an abiding interest in uh, infrastructure long-term productivity. Uh, one of the most famous papers suggesting that infrastructure was key. Sorry about that. I'm gonna switch to my uh, headphones. <laughs> uh, because uh, there's a lot of barking going on. Um, the uh, Ash Hour actually argued that uh, the slowdown in productivity growth in the US was because of the decline in infrastructure investment. And this was during uh, the 19... Okay, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, now you'll be able to hear me and not my chihuahua. You wouldn't believe by the barking that that's a seven pound dog. Okay, so... Um, the uh, And of course, there's current bipartisan support in the US for a big infrastructure package, but of course, it's being held up for political reasons. But so what I try to do in this paper is ask what are the short run and the long run effects of government investment in general and infrastructure investment in particular? Before you go on, could I stop yes. you for a second? Uh, yes, please. And, and note that, uh, yeah. that the long and summer's paper is a Brookings paper that was discussed by one Valerie Vaby uh, in the best discussion in the history of discussion. It's published with the paper itself and the uh, you know, basketball and ice skating analogy. Uh, and and um, I think you were vicious and it was great. So uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't mean to be so vicious. It was more the, the analogy made it that, you know, as academics, we like precision. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, so what does this paper do? Uh, it does a number of things. Uh, it, it's sort of like a mini handbook chapter. It's one way to think about it, as several people suggested. Um, it analyzes the effect of government investment and DSGE models. Um, it starts with a simple neoclassical model 
and then goes on to medium scale new Keynesian model. So it builds on the, the key work of Baxter and King, Leeper et al, Buakez, Simpson Wolf and Boehm are just some of the leading uh, papers on which it builds. It also discusses multipliers, including the importance of the starting level of public capital. And then I use insights from the theoretical models to interpret empirical work that are estimating the aggregate effects of government investment spending. And then I review and extend some estimates of the short run effects of government spending with particular attention to highway spending. And then I finally consider whether the US is under investing in infrastructure. And I develop a simple uh, calculation based on the neoclassical model that could be used uh, in any country. Of course, it's sort of a bird's eye view, but I think it's a useful starting point before getting into sort of heterogeneous uh, types of public capital. All right. So any questions after the brief introduction before I get into the quantitative analysis? Okay, so I'm gonna start, as I said, with the stylized neoclassical model. I'll then turn to the medium scale New Keynesian model. And then a big emphasis is gonna be on the importance of time to spend and time to build, because it turns out that really affects the results. I'll talk about long run multipliers, the importance of the initial level of public capital, and then generalizations that significantly affect the results. Okay, so let's start with benchmark day classical model, you know, one of the first weeks in, in grad macro, perhaps, uh, depending on when does long run or short run. Uh, so we start with the resource constraint, which, you know, tells us consumption plus private investment. So I is private investment plus government consumption spending. And this is, not just outlays, this is actual purchases, and same here, and government investment spending have to add up to less the amount of output in the economy. And here I'm assuming a closed economy. Obviously there are interesting generalizations for a small open economy. The utility uh, function- so for, for those of us who haven't been thinking about public finance for a long time, mm -hmm. what exactly is the difference between outlays and actual purchases? Uh, good point, all right. So purchases are when the government the, the, the way I teach it in my principles, purchases is when the government sends a check to somebody and receives something directly in return. Transfers or other kinds of outlays that aren't purchases would be say, when the government sends out uh, stimulus payments and to households and expects nothing in return. Okay. Okay. Okay, but so this is not a difference between, um, I mean, I understand that, well, even I understand the difference between transfers and, and, and purchases, but is there a difference that I should be thinking about between the government buying something today and not paying for it just yet, or the government, you know, um, providing the payment for something that is to be constructed, but hasn't been constructed just yet. So, you know, one of the timings here is the difference between timings of the, especially in capital, right? It's not only time to build, but it's also the difference between when the government pays for something and when the thing is actually constructed. And okay. that probably would count as a difference between outlays and purchases too. I, I, okay, that then is what I call time to spend. Okay. And, it, and every kind of spending I'm going to talk about will be purchases where, where out, there are outlays and they will get something in return either now or when the project is finished. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's it's not transfers to households. Is the key part. Wow. Uh, it's and it's not social security payments and it's not in the US Medicaid and Medicare are considered transfers. So those are not purchases. Although if you had a national health system it would be considered purchases if the government owns the hospitals or or pays directly to the hospital. So, so that's a little bit funny. So in the US, when you look at government purchases, they are much less than government outlays because Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are such big parts of government outlays. Okay. All right. So the utilities function is pretty standard uh, with a, one additional term. It's what's known as a McCurdy utility function where we have log of consumption here and then uh, we have disutility from labor. So N could be hours or employment, whatever you want. And for simplicity, I'm assuming 
that the uh, any utility from government consumption outlay spending uh, is separable in the utility function. This just leads to simplification so that we don't have that amount leading to changes in marginal rates of substitution. All right, so it doesn't mean that uh, more complicated models aren't more realistic. It's just we're trying to focus on some key parts here about government consumption versus government investment. The production function starts out looking very standard. Cobb Douglas, this is TFP. Uh, we have constant returns to scale in capital and labor. My timing here is what I call dynair timing because it goes, I decide to use the same timing in the papers as with all the programs I posted so that people don't get confused. Otherwise, it's very easy to get confused. So KT minus one is capital at the end of period T minus one. The new thing here is government capital. So K super G is the stock of public capital. You can think of it as infrastructure in particular if you want to, but it could be any kind of public capital. And notice that since I assume constant returns to scale and private inputs, if theta G, this key exponent that you're gonna hear about over and over again during this talk, if that is greater than zero, then there are aggregate increasing returns to scale in this economy. Okay. Government capital accumulation, uh, proceeds be as uh, if there's an increase in government investment that leads to government public capital accumulation. This is the depreciation rate delta G and otherwise that's a pretty standard accumulation equation. We have a similar equation for private capital uh, where I is private investment and then there's a potentially different depreciation rate for private capital. May Again, I have a question. Sure. So I guess in this case, you have to keep a kg exogenous so that model doesn't explode. Is that what's happening yes. here? So, so very yeah. good question. In the baseline model, simply because I'm trying to run experiments of exogenous changes, I do keep it exogenous. However, I do talk about the optimal level of public capital. And in that case, I, I did have to worry about the increased returns. And you'll see that the theta Gs I use are actually quite small and I, I uh, looked at a bunch of simulations to make sure that I was at uh, a maximum there. But when you talk about optimum, it's going to be steady state so that it doesn't explode still. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The, um, and then again, for simplicity, I'm going to assume, assume lump sum taxation. That is because, uh, again, Distortionary taxes are much more realistic, but the effects of distortionary taxes can really depend on their timing. And I want to uh, abstract from that. So I'm just gonna have lump sum tax financing. So in this baseline model, we will have Ricardian equivalents. Now notice that when I move to the medium scale New Keynesian model, I'll have some rule of thumb households there. So Ricardian equivalents will not hold even with this lump sum tax financing. So comments, I already made some of these, no distortionary taxes, uh, that's then it's equivalent to a social planner problem. Uh, the separability of government consumption simplifies the problem. Um, in the extension, as I mentioned, I'm going to allow the, a, the social planner to choose uh, government investment and government capital in a particular extension. All right, now, uh, when I was presenting this at Stanford a few months ago, uh, Chad Jones and Pete Kleenow did not like a, a production function with increasing returns to scale. And they were suggesting another one. And when I looked at it, when we followed up with email, um, I said, oh, well, that's actually a special case of the kind of production function that uh, Glom and Ravi Kumar analyzed in their really important work in the early 1990s. And so here's this, this special case of it, but it's, it's a very uh, nifty kind of thing. So it looks just like the other production function that I was using, all right? So we have with these terms, all right? The difference though now is that we're putting these private uh, parts of the Cobb-Douglas production function, the denominator. What this gives us is a production function that features congestion externalities, but aggregate constant returns to scale. So you can solve this model as private firms treating it as they have constant returns to scale, very, very standard, because they don't take into account the congestion effect of them hiring more uh, 
factors and producing more. And this congestion effect shows up then in this addition of the, the denominator to this uh, term. So then there's a negative externality. This is a very interesting uh, production function, but it leads to more complications because optimal policy involves both optimal distortionary tax to get rid of the externality and the level of government investment. But th that's, I, I ran some, after uh, they made this comment, I ran some simulations and got very similar results to what I was showing with the regular one and the message was very similar. So, so I don't have those additional results. May, may, may I ask a quick question? Sure. On that. So yeah. what you're saying is that when the firm takes the first of the conditions, the K and N term inside the parenthesis stays taken as given. That's what you're yes. saying. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So you can think of it, I mean, I just because I was trying to fit it on here, you can think of the first K and N as little, you know, often people, uh, I need to do that, as little K's and N's, all okay. right? And then these are the big, which are the, the social or the aggregate ones and, that I just taken. And on average, they're the, they're the same. So Yes, okay. yes. So, so I, I just skipped that step just to show this. Good. All right. So let's just review the mechanisms in the basic neoclassical model. Remember that uh, in the neoclassical model, an increase in any kind of government purchases extracts resources from the economy. And the main thing is that's going to lead to a negative wealth effect. Now, this negative wealth effect will show up, uh, will lead to a decrease in consumption because households feel less uh, wealthy and a decrease in leisure assuming it's a normal good, which means that they will increase their labor supply. And contrary to all of our Keynesian intuition, that increase in labor supply, not labor demand, is the only reason that output increases in the short run uh, from the neoclassical model, and that sense capital is fixed. Okay. Now, with government investment, though, there's a counteracting positive wealth effect because that increase in public capital that's gonna gradually be built up is gonna raise future output, that counteracting positive wealth effect means that the net negative wealth effect is smaller. So there will be a smaller increase in labor supply in the short run and a smaller decrease in consumption, all right? So government investment spending actually leads to more crowding out of private investment in the short run. In the neoclassical model. I could they ask you a question on, um, on that? Yeah, you know, you're more than welcome to defer this, but um, you know, this is all happening because this is a single sector model where uh, you know nothing interesting really goes on. But if they, <laughs> you know, use the framework of say uh, Gary, Gary, uh, Werning, and the others uh, that they had for uh, analysis of the COVID shock. Right, where supply shocks and demand shocks, you know, endogenous end up being correlated. Uh, that kind of a mechanism, I've never seen anyone use that for government investment analysis. But, uh, you know, now that I'm kind of convinced that it makes sense, that seems to be uh, alternative modeling strategy that is, you know, in the same DSG mindset, but uh, fundamentally very different. Because by giving a supply kick on this end and a demand kick on that end, you're actually creating a lot of um, different mechanisms that end up having interesting dynamics, to say the least. Yes. No, no you could definitely uh, do something like that. I mean, so, so that, that, that paper came out after I had done the initial versions of this paper. And, you know, I think it's good to start with uh, the basics. Uh, you know, until that paper's uh, played out a little bit, but you're going to be, I'm going to show you some empirical work that even some of the initial, uh, uh, you know, if you look at employment and highway construction after an increase, you are not seeing the kinds of effects that you should see. You're just seeing very little happen there. So, so at least in the empirical work, uh, there's some questions about some of the mechanisms and, and I can show those to you. Okay. Another way that I thought you were going to, to more uh, talk about, uh, you know, be more realistic about, say, transportation infrastructure. Um, there, there's a really nice paper by Gallen and Winston uh, that takes a DSGE model, 
but is much more serious about you know, what the benefits of transportation infrastructure are. So in their model, uh, one of the benefits is that it saves time for households for commuting and uh, uh, shopping. It also saves time for firms, but then in the short run, it can have quite negative effects because the uh, uh, disruption effects of having all the roads torn up when you're doing this can, can have a negative production effect. So, so there are all kinds of interesting ways to take this from the very stylized, you know, one sector model with the usual mechanisms. But it's, but because most of the, those other models are built on the neoclassical model, it's really important to uh, uh, remember what those mechanisms are because they're gonna be present unless they're explicitly shut down with some of the new Keynesian bells and whistles. On that note, let yeah, me yeah. advertise uh, the work of our uh, Bana Demir, who, so in the past two decades, this country has had this manic uh, highway expansion. That was a signature um, policy of the government, and they were building, building roads left and right. Um, okay. And our colleague analyzed the effect of that on intracity trade. And in fact, um, you know, when your city is connected to the border via the construction of a new highway, what happens to your exports and, and whatnot? Okay. It's a great paper that I will send to you. Oh yeah, no, that's very nice. So what one of my grad students uh, went back and uh, looked using panel state data in the US, the effects of the interstate highway program in the US that was during the 50s, 60s and into the 70s and you know, using very modern methods to do it and you know, found pretty big multipliers from that because of the interstate uh, trade. So, so I, I guess yeah. here the, the labor supply sensitivity to the wealth effect is really important. Really important, and I but will talk about that. I'd like to ask, what if you shut it down the GHG GH, GH type preferences? Well, if you shut down the wealth effect on labor supply, you yeah. don't get an output effect. Okay, I see. So I think with that, those kind of preferences, you're not going to see any meaningful multiplier. Okay. Right. But that's, yeah. that's in, in combination with the Ricardian household, right? It, it's the two right. together. Right. Yeah. So, so you could probably use GHH preferences in uh, the new Keynesian model I'm about to show you, but, but that's because I've already assumed that, that uh, workers are off their labor supply curve. So, you know, <laughs> there's several ways to shut down the negative wealth effect. Okay, so speaking of calibration, let me just talk about a few key parameters. Uh, one is the uh, fresh elasticity. So the parameter governing that, the fee I set to 0.25, which implies a fresh elasticity of uh, four. All right, why did I set it so high for this baseline? Well, first of all, um, just to follow up on Baxter and King, most people don't realize that by having the log log utility function, uh, Baxter and King's implicit fresh elasticity is something like four. Also, because my medium scale New Keynesian model uh, pivots off of the Gali Lopez Salido Valles 2007 paper, uh, I wanted to use a lot of what they, they had a very high fresh elasticity. So I'm putting a high fresh elasticity in the baseline, but I will show you what happens when I lower it. In, in some way, because as you'll see, my message is so negative for uh, government investment uh, as a short run stimulus. I wanted to uh, make it, g give it all of the uh, chances it could uh, have to have high multipliers so that I could show you what happens when you put in the time to spend uh, delays. So uh, the exponent on, oops, where am I? The exponent on private capital in the production function is 0.36. That's pretty standard with the higher uh, capital share these days. My baseline for this all important parameter theta G is gonna be 0.05, but later I will show you what happens when uh, that's higher. And then we're gonna talk in detail in the empirical part about what theta G could be. The uh, depreciation rates of public, private and public capital I calibrated from Bureau of Economic Analysis data. I set the steady state share of total government spending to GDP uh, at 17.5%, which was about what the US was in 2019. And um, also, uh, the, I also calibrated the government investment share of GDP to 3.5%, which is what approximately the US was. I'm gonna assume that there's a shock to appropriations. Um, 
it's not permanent, but there's a lot of persistence in it. I'm going to assume that the row in the AR1 process is 0.95. That's similar to what uh, Leeper et al. did. And so appropriations AP are just this AR1 process. And in the basic versions of the model where there are no time to spend or time to build delays, it's just a question of whether I shot government consumption by set, setting it equal to that appropriation you know, contemporaneously, or whether I shot government investment uh, and set it equal to that appropriation. All right, so let's see what we get in this you know, pretty standard neoclassical model, very simple one. The green line shows you cons government consumption, when you have a shock to government consumption versus the blue dash line, which is when you have a shock to government investment, all right? And over here with government spending, uh, they lie on top of each other. That's why you can't see both lines here. So the process itself is the, is the same for both. Um, okay, so let's look at output. When there's a shock to government consumption, output rises, the multiplier is a little bit less than 0.5 because that government investment, that's a percent of GDP. Uh, and so that you can read a multiplier straight off of the output uh, one since I've normalized it to be 1% of GDP and then output goes up by almost 0.5%, okay? So output rises, we do get a positive multiplier but it's you know, about a half and then it gradually goes down. Uh, we get the usual things where consumption decreases, that's because of that negative wealth effect and uh, labor input increases. That's the reason we have the increase in output uh, let's see, uh, private investment is crowded out and, um, you know, various things happen with wages. Okay. Now let's contrast that with the effect of an increase in government investment, all right, of the same amount, uh, but let's look at the difference in the economy. As I mentioned, with government investment, we're going to have less of an increase in output because we have less of an increase in labor input. And that's because that negative wealth effect is not as strong. Because of that positive wealth effect from public capital building up and leading to increased output in the future, the, um, you're not gonna get as much of a wealth effect. The result is that in the short run, private investment falls much more with government investment, which is just, contrary to what you might think ex ante if you haven't thought through the model. Now, later on, private investment is going to boom as public capital uh, builds up, but not in the short run, okay? So these, this is basically illustrating that difference in the wealth effect of government consumption versus government investment. So in this next uh, table, what I do is simply uh, look at the integral uh, under the impulse response for output uh, over the first year. I'm going to show you longer run multipliers uh, in a few slides. Okay. Can I, can I ask before you go there? Sure. Um, I mean, in an obvious sense, these are all implied by the model assumptions, but um, I guess how exactly they map into these results in the following sense. Um, I could imagine getting exactly the same results if I gave an exogenous shock to private investment. Okay. Except that your functional forms separate the impact of private investment on output and public investment on output. So they wouldn't be the same because one is affecting output with alpha, the other one is theta, right? So, but right. In, the, in the following set, you know, I guess part of the question here is um, we think of private investment as part of wealth so that when that goes up, it doesn't create the self same wealth effect. But that's effectively because, you know, I can undo the investment and eat it. And that's why I don't think my lifetime consumption budget has changed. With irreversible investment, um, I would be thinking that, you know, if I'm using this for investment now, my lifetime consumption opportunity has gone down. And that would lead to a similar kind of mechanic. I guess the question I'm asking is, you know, is there anything special about government investment? where we're saying, well, you know, it's not all that much of a huge boost to output. Well, so, so, so let me ask, I, I, I'm trying to think of what an exogenous shock to private investment means. Um, I mean, what, well, because, a trembling hand investment world where 
I find myself having overinvested something of that sort. Oh, oh, if you found yourself overinvested. And so then you're having negative private investment now or? Uh, no, that the overinvestment no. is the trust okay. itself, right? So, so there was a misallocation right? where they invested more than they intended. That's, that's an interesting thing. So, so it's as though you suddenly took consumption. I mean, in general, these exogenous yeah. shocks are weird things. And um, exogenous government spending and shocks to government spending aren't more weird than exogenous shocks to private investing. Well, no, um, because, I mean, government, I mean, shocks to government, because, I, you know, for example, I always look at ones induced by political events. Right. I think they make, I think shocks to government spending but, uh, but have right, a lot more. This, you know, if you really want a stupid story, the government regulates that you have to invest more than you used to invest normally. Okay. Right? There you have it. Uh, you know, it's a crisis right. time. You know, things are terrible. So rather than the government investing itself, it passes a law okay. that says, you know, you're going to be whatever. Yeah, people. that would be the same. Yeah. That, that would be um, the same. Yes. But the effects wouldn't be the same in this model, or, or would they? I, you know, I'd have to simulate. It'd be easy to simulate. So, but that's an interesting but question. Um, yeah. The question here is, are, are we seeing the differences because of the exogenous nature of the shock? Or is there any, something inherently different about government doing the investment? Well, I mean, there's two things. So first of all, obviously, this is some kind of exogenous shock. I mean, yeah. what are the other typical ones? The preference shocks. So we could, we could uh, shock beta yeah. or we could shock the parameter, the disutility of labor. Um, we could shock even the, uh, we could do sort of a, a, a Greenwood, Herkowitz and Crusell shock where the efficiency with which investment turns into private capital changes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That that would be, so that that would sort of maybe be the most easiest one to think about, um, and I could run through those, but um, I'm just not sure. I mean, I, I shock as I usually say, shocks to government spending just make a lot more sense to me than shocks to monetary policy because you wonder what those actually mean. Fair enough. Uh, they usually are changes to the policy function, but we can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. So, so, so the idea is that there's a, a lot of politics involved in fiscal. And so you can imagine these shocks in terms of, you know, somebody being elected and, and those sorts of things. But, but no, it, it would I mean, be. I'm agreeing with you on the government spending. Yeah. Part. The question I'm asking really is part of this is, you know, investment went up. Is that good? Right. You know, right. Um, and I normally wouldn't think, well, is it the public investment that's going up or the private investment that is going right. up? But in, this, right. but in these models, it's really important that when it's the public investment that's going up, we go, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. And then private right. investment is all good. Uh, right. It's not very obvious why these two things are so different other right. than initial modeling assumptions. No, oh, that's a good. So uh, the Sims Wolf paper, they have two papers, and in one of them that I that I cite in my paper, they do talk about the welfare aspects of government consumption and government investment. So I'm not sure if they do the kind of experiment you say, but it would be an interesting experiment to do. I, I, I was just going to, I mean, in relation to the question, yeah, here um, government consumption enters separately from the utility function. Yes. If those things enter uh, multiplicatively or in some complementary ways, things would look be looking very different. Oh, it would look very, very different. And I know yes. this from when I was doing my oil discovery shock paper and then happened to read uh, by Anna Pia Chacon in the JME where she had uh, government uh, consumption being either it could be a substitute or a complement to private consumption. And when I was running through those models, I was just amazed at how different the results could get. Yeah. But you know, also yeah. I think the Sims Wolf paper has some non-separability of government consumption. So, so that paper actually does a lot of nice things that that might be able to answer some of the questions that both of you just raised. So that's what I, I, I just, Yeah. Because I mean, I, here investment check and government um, and private and government investment check they wouldn't be so different here. But I think. In that kind of setting, it would be very different, is my guess. Well, the, the, what, what I'm doing here is focusing on what I think is the, the uh, uh, you know, inherent difference between the two, which is that government consumption does not build up any stock of anything. 
and government investment does. Oh, That's yes, what I see. Government investment shock and the private investment shock. Both yeah, of yes. them contribute to capital in the production yes. function. Yes, I think yes. the way they enter here with the crypto glass specification means they wouldn't make so much of a difference here. Right. That's what I meant. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it depends on what the, the ratio, where your the starting point will matter. You know where where your your public investment is relative to your private investment, course, just in course. terms of the output. It will affect the output elasticities. Right? Yes. So. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So uh, one year cumulative multipliers here. Uh, so in the baseline for government consumption, so I show government consumption, government investment, and uh, ignore the the final column for now. Uh, for government consumption we have a one-year multiplier of 0.47. Again, that's the integral under the impulse response. It's slightly lower for government investment. And again, it's because of that differential uh, the size of the negative wealth effect. Now we can also see what happens when we change the Frisch elasticity to uh, look more like what microeconomists like. Notice how far uh, the multiplier falls when we lower the Frisch elasticity. Now, something else, and I, I started doing this after working on the New Keynesian model. New Keynesian models often put investment adjustment costs and capital utilization in them. Now, there's nothing inherently Keynesian about that. You know, there's no uh, sticky price or anything. So I said, well, what happens if I put it in the neoclassical model? So look at how much the multipliers go up. So why is that? Well, when there's an investment adjustment cost, you're shutting out the crowding out of investment, right? Because private investment can't do that sharp movement downward that we see here, okay? Um, so the new Keynesian models that get these high multipliers aren't getting them just because of the prices, uh, sticky prices and things like that, which I'll show you. It's also the investment adjustment cost. The second addition is capital utilization. All my work that I've done on the auto industry, I think variable capital utilization is really important. It's in a lot of these models. By allowing firms to vary capital services in the short run, that helps overcome the decreasing returns to scale for labor, diminishing returns to labor in the short run, so that supply is more elastic in the short run. And you can see that both of these features, which are just you know, reasonable, real sort of features, uh, lead to higher multipliers in this model. All right, so let's now move to a median scale New Keynesian model. All right, as I said, I'm gonna put adjustment costs on investment. So Galil Lopez Alido of Valles had adjustment costs on capital, but more of the recent models use adjustment costs on investment. So I wanted to put these on there to be uh, more similar to those models. So as I said, this severely mutes the short run crowding out effect on private investment. Also variable utilization of capital and the cost of increasing the utilization of capital is standard for these models, which is uh, a convexity of the depreciation rate and utilization. Uh, sticky prices and non-competitive <coughs> product markets, that's very standard. Even the simplest New Keynesian model has that. However, I did not want to leave off there because um, I don't like the way the mechanism of a, of a simple New Keynesian model works. And it's because of the recent work by Per Crusell and his co-authors. So they had an RE stud paper that showed on heterogeneous agents, but one of the most important results that came out of there, and that was looking at monetary, was that they figured out that uh, the impact of monetary policy in that paper was in part because of a negative wealth effect. What crisis? That means that markups are countercyclical, and it means that profits are countercyclical. So when you have expansionary monetary policy, profits go down in the model, and uh, households feel less wealthy, and therefore supply more labor. Okay. When I saw that, and I was writing this paper, I emailed Pierre Crusell, and I said, "Wow, does that also apply?" in the fiscal context. And he, he says, let me talk to my co-authors and, and we'll get back to you. And a week later, they got back to me writing up a note at that point, and now it's a full paper saying, yes, this is also the case in the fiscal context. The reason that the simple new Keynesian model was getting higher multipliers was 
because it was adding on an additional negative wealth effect over and above the neoclassical one that also comes through that model because countercyclical mark an increase in government spending was leading markups to go down leading profits to go down making households feel even less wealthy and therefore they were increasing their labor supply all right when i uh told about that result in one of my previous seminars, and I was using NK for New Keynesian model. And one of the labor economists in the audience, Charlie Brown of Michigan, said, I guess NK stands for not Keynesian, because having everything go for with you know, come from wealth effects, it's just not Keynesian. All right. So that is the reason that I also include uh, sticky wages and non-competitive labor markets. OK, I'm not completely happy with the way they're currently modeled in the literature, but, you know, I was willing to, to go along with it just to get rid of that other negative wealth effect. All right. So this parallels the price setup. It's actually built on a paper by Colciago, who extends the Gali et al. model to put in sticky wages and non-competitive labor markets. Also following Gali et al. and Kaplan uh, Violante and others, I have a mix of life cycle permanent income hypothesis consumers and rule of thumb consumers. I'm going to have half of the households be rule of thumb consumers in the baseline. That's going to give us larger effects of temporary income on consumption. I'm going to stick with the very elastic labor supply uh, using that high fresh elasticity. And then the monetary and fiscal policy rules, the, uh, the monetary rule is a tailor rule with only inflation, same as Godley et al. And then the fiscal policy is lump sum taxes, and they respond to lag debt and spending. Okay. All right, so let's look at that same kind of experiment I ran in the neoclassical model. Let's uh, do it here for the new Keynesian model. All right, so again, it's either government consumption in green or government investment in blue going up. Let's look here at output, all right? Now we get a much bigger multiplier. Rather than under 0.5, we get a multiplier 1.3 on impact, all right? But contrary to uh, the previous case, there's very little difference in the short run, very short run, uh, in terms of the output impact. And that's because with workers off their labor supply curves, there's just, things are not hap happening through that channel, the wealth effect on labor supply. All right, it's, it's other things going on uh, that we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Labor input is going up, not because workers are supplying more, but because firms are demanding more. And the reason is that all of those rule of thumb consumers, I've calibrated them to be point, you know, half of the population, are helping private consumption go up in contrast to the usual case where private consumption goes down. Now, with the investment adjustment costs, nothing happens right away or very little with investment and then it starts going up. But notice that uh, you can see here even after uh, up to four years that private investment is, is uh, in the case of the shock to government investment is gonna go up much more because the government investment is raising the marginal product of private investment. So you'll get a difference there as you get towards years two and three, but um, you don't get much difference in the short run. And again, you know, it's because that public capital is building up when you have the shock to government investment. Uh, other, you know, features, capital utilization definitely goes up. We have a some some difference in the wage across the two uh, channels, uh, across government consumption versus government investment. Okay. So the one-year multipliers for this case, the first panel is what I'd shown you before. Remember that uh, for government investment and government consumption, those were 0 0.47, 0 0.40. Now for the one year, uh, for the baseline New Keynesian model, we have a multiplier about one, and it's slightly bigger uh, for government investment, all right? But suppose that we leave all of the Keynesian sticky features there, rule of thumb, households, all that stuff, but suppose we shut down the investment adjustment costs and uh, don't allow variable utilization it plummets. So there's hardly any difference between the multiplier, between a neoclassical model without that and a new Keynesian model without that. So it just shows you how important that is. Now there's a big caveat here and Sarah Zuber and I've been 
kind of working on a project in the background for a while. We, we'd actually started working on it at the same time I was starting to work on this. We haven't done, this really depends on our assumption of the AR1 process for, for government spending the appropriations. Um, if you use instead, say, an AR3, which I like to do to, to capture the hump shape, you know, the fact that there's announcement of government spending and then you get a hump shape, you can get very different results. But I decided in this paper to go with the AR1 because that's so standard and I wanted to, you know, be able to compare to two things in the literature. But that's something to keep in mind is this interaction between the process driving government consumption, government, any kind of government spending, and these investment adjustment costs can lead to all kinds of complicated interactions. And the other thing- Can I ask you- yes. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, maybe this is a bit tangential to what you're doing, but generally these infrastructure announcements are basically announced initially and then uh, taken over. So, you know, if I'm going to, you know, do infrastructure investment, I say as a government, I'll do it, but I'll do that in six months. So that sounds more like a new shock to me. So if okay. I, I, we're going to talk about that final okay. column Sorry. in a few slides. No, great question. And, and it's absolutely central to the message from this paper. Um, was there another question? Sorry. Okay. I, I mean, so I guess I, I just want to understand what's going on. So I think what you're saying is, when you have an uh, investment adjustment cost, um, this um, actually prevents private crowding out, crowding out. And that's the key mechanism here, right? Without this adjustment yes. cost, uh, basically the effect is completely muted as a result of there being, oh, because here with the adjustment cost, investment, private investment doesn't react so much. Right. You end up having stronger effect. This is what I'm understanding. Yes, yes. And, and, and that you, you get that stronger effect because of those, uh, the income generated for the rule of thumb households, and then that increases labor demand and, yes. and those sorts of things. Exactly. So those, those channels are shut, shut off when you remove adjustment, investment it, adjustment. Costs. Exactly. Because, yeah, because, because so, so, so this is a, you know, we actually had an entire reading group last spring on this. In the standard model, so, so my uh, co colleague Johannes Wieland, you know, has a paper it, forthcoming in Econometrica on this high intertemporal elasticity of investment, and it's something that Chris House had written on uh, Barsky and House, and the that crowding out comes from the standard model because investment is a durable good, and therefore you're very willing to intertemporally substitute investment, um, much more so than you would ever see in the data. And so the investment adjustment costs are trying to temper that intertemporal elasticity of substitution. So, so there's an argument that you sort of need these investment adjustment costs to overcome that implausibly high intertemporal elasticity of substitution of investment. I mean, this makes sense because investment is a tiny fraction of capital stock. Yes. You're very willing to intertemporally substitute this. Exactly, exactly. But, but, and that's, mm -hmm. can, I, can I take up on the, the, the point you made about AR2, AR3 processes? So when you do mm -hmm. that, the peak of the shock kicks in later. Yes. So that means that the elasticity will be higher because you expect persistent yes. um, positive effect going forward, right? Yes. Okay, thank and, you. And you'll, and you'll see some of that when I do my time to spend time to build uh, simulations, okay. which I will be doing, yes. Thank you. Um, just a uh, couple of things. Oh, sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so um, another exercise on the, um, on the nature of the shock is rather than thinking of an AR process, to, is to think of this as a regime switch where the government goes into a you know, high investment, high tax mode. Um, and <laughs> uh, that's not completely unreasonable that once you begin to do more investment, there's going to be a political clientele right. that's going to keep on asking for it. Um, and it's even more interesting to ask, um, and on the impact, the effects are the same, whether this is actually the case or people think that, right. you know, now that the democratic government has uh, passed right. legislation to increase investment, right, now we're back to a world of uh, large government doing more investment, whatnot. And yes. that would be something I would... It's not obvious to me uh, what it will do to the multiplier. Um, yeah. Well, I, I I had actually run you know a variety of simulations, but you know finally uh, you know decide to use these in the paper. But you could certainly have a permanent increase yeah. in uh, the amount of ca your capital output ratio, and when you do that, you get even more um, 
muted negative wealth effects in the short run. In fact, it can be positive so that so that people so that consumption goes up in the short run. And then, of course, without any investment adjustment costs, private investment just collapses in the short run. In the okay. you know, but that wouldn't be ideal because sorry, but no, but that wouldn't be ideal here because I think you don't want to change the status state. Just to right. evaluate the effect, right? I think well, we need to let you change the steady state. Yeah, okay. And smoke that large effect will be due to the change of steady state in the long run. Yes. Way. Yes. That would be ideal. Now, the other question I have is on the policy implication. And again, um, you know, feel free to come to this whenever you want. But let's say I take the you know small uh, multiplier, it's it's 0.1, right? Um, this might make me think along two lines, which one is, you know, I have a multiplier small, so I'm not worth doing this. The other one is, you know, as opposed to doing what else? If the multiplier is so small, we'll have to do even more of this. Right. Well, so remember, these are one year. Okay. And yeah. what, what I'm, let, let, let's come back to that because I, I am going to ha have a distinction in terms of the policy implications for the short run versus the long run. And, and it's very different. Uh, and, and when is a good time to, uh, it start a big infrastructure project. Okay. And it's contrary to what we think, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because of the long run. And, and so the bottom line that I will say is, this is actually a great time for the US to undertake infrastructure spending because we are in an expansion and um, we don't wanna do it during a recession, contrary to what we all thought 10 years ago. Okay, it's not okay. obvious to me, so I'm looking forward okay. to that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll is, it a, is it the tech space issue? No, 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 no. no. We'll, 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 <laughs> I'm going to leave you in, in limbo <laughs> waiting for <laughs> um, just a couple of things. Putting the first elasticity lower does lower the multiplier, but not nearly as much as getting rid of the investment adjustment costs and utilization. Taking out rule of thumb houses, uh, households, that lowers the multiplier somewhat. But again, nothing has as big an impact as this uh, investment adjustment cost. All right. So let's talk about implementation delays, all right? So a big message from we Leaper Walker Yang's paper, which looks at a neoclassical model, and as I say, you know, I build quite a bit on that, is that they argue that infrastructure investment has an important time to build feature. They say after appropriations are made, actual spending happens gradually. Public capital is often not productive until fully completed. And they cite a number of studies that find that the lags are about on average one year for road maintenance, but four years for new roads and highways, okay? And when, let me just say, when I was presenting at this infrastructure conference, you know, where there were a lot of people who were experts on the transportation infrastructure, they were all nodding their heads and they say the regulatory environment in the US has made it so hard to do anything new and, and it just takes forever to get through all of those uh, barriers to be able to actually get infrastructure going. Now, I think there are actually two kinds of delays that when Leaper and Walker Yang talk about this, they have both of these, but I think it's important to split them apart. One is what I'm going to call a time to spend, and the second is the time to build. So on the time to spend, so remember that AP was appropriations, I assume that the actual government purchases is going to be uh, a weighted average of the lagged appropriations because it takes time to actually spend out that appropriation, all right? And I'm going to assume it's six quarters. So that's a lot less than four years and it's slightly over one year. So I'm, I'm going to be calibrating things to smaller lags. You could easily change the calibration. Time to build on the other hand is this idea that for example, if you uh, uh, build a bullet train in California, all right, so they have all these pillars up there, they've done all this building, spent billions, but nobody is riding a bullet train in California because at least you have to link both sides of the segment, all right? And that's what we're getting here where the appropriation, you know, in this case, I'm gonna say six quarters ago, uh, that's when it starts showing up in the, the finished capital that then goes into the production function. All right, and I don't do it, but you could separately analyze time to spend versus time to build. All right, just some evidence on implementation delays. Remember the Obama stimulus, the ARA, uh, really tried hard to look for shovel ready projects. 
despite that, uh, a year after the stimulus, they had spent less than 60% of the uh, appropriations. Two years after, they'd spent a little bit over 80%. Now, the, the delays weren't so important for the Great Recession in the US because the unemployment rate stayed so high for so long. So it wasn't so bad to have this extra stimulus kind of uh, rolling out slowly. But for a standard recession, the economy could be in a strong expansion, and then that stimulus is still rolling out. So it wouldn't hit the economy at the time you would want it to hit. All right, so let's look at what happens in our model. Here, I'm just going to use the new Keynesian model, and I'm just going to look at government investment. The blue uh, dash line is what we had before. That's with no delays. That's a shock to government investment. The purple line with the circles is what happens when we have six quarter time to spend and time to build delays, okay? So looking over here, the uh, in the initial case, uh, government spending is just like the appropriations, but we have a delay here and then a gradual buildup uh, in the, in the, with the purple line when we have time to spend uh, there. So what is the effect? Uh, how, what yeah. exactly is the information structure here is? I think it was Wuxin who asked ah, the news point. effect earlier. Uh, so it's an MIT shock where there's a shock and then everybody knows what the path is going okay. forward. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, so the news is very important. And even though it's not as fancy as a regime shift model, you could do an MIT shock that, that basically has the same kind of effect of a regime shift. Yeah. The... Um, Obviously, you wouldn't capture the uncertainties of whether the regime uh, will shift back at the next election, which, which would be an interesting uh, point for another paper, but uh, that I'm not capturing that kind of uncertainty here. All right, so uh, remember that we had a nice, uh, oops, sorry. Why is the minute? Just a sec. I don't know why this suddenly you broke jumped. It. I broke it, yes. That's very strange. Uh oh, I'm suddenly in a different. Aha, uh -huh, okay. It was the one I gave yesterday at the Central Bank of Chile <laughs> that, I, that I'd accidentally uh, pressed the tab for. All right, there we are. Um, all right, let's look at output. We had that nice high multiplier because of all of the Keynesian bells and whistles. Just a sec, I need to move this up because by jumping presentations there. Okay, look in contrast, what happens when there's time to spend and time to build? Output actually goes down slightly in the short run or at least doesn't increase. And then just slowly starts increasing, all right? Why does that happen? Well. If there's no initial spending, then you don't have an increase in labor demand, right? So lab labor input in this new Keynesian model with workers off their uh, supply curves because of the non-competitive markets is driven by labor demand. There's no reason to increase labor demand. That means that uh, those rule of thumb households have no reason to uh, raise their consumption. And so the permanent income households are, are reducing theirs in the short run. So you, you have consumption going down. Uh, you even have investment going down. Capital utilization is basically unchanged. Real wages are going down uh, and labor input, as I said. Gradually though, then you start getting the effects. So labor input starts rising, output starts rising, and, uh, and then finally public capital starts rising and uh, private investment starts rising later. But you can see in the short run, uh, you're not getting any of the effects that you would want from a stimulus program because it takes time to spend. And it's only through that spending that you get all of these nice new Keynesian effects that give you the higher uh, multiplier. So now we can finally look at the last column. All right, so that lovely government investment multiplier over the first year of 1.12 turns into 0.08. Okay, when you have delays. And uh, let me say that this is important. Usually I uh, calculate my multipliers. If, the, if, if there's no delays, 
a multiplier is best calculated as the integral under the uh, output impulse response function divided by the integral under the government spending one. When you have news and delayed spending, you're trying to divide by something close to zero. So with these multipliers, I am dividing them by that the appropriations, all right? So, so the idea here is if the government wants bang for buck in terms of appropriating spending, what is the multiplier, okay? So, because that's what we care about for short run stimulus. So the multiplier falls to close to zero. Um, it stays zero, investment adjustment costs aren't even that important because of that slow buildup. Um, if you reduce the fresh elasticity or take away rule of thumb households, you even get slightly negative multipliers in the short run, all right? So the message from this is, the government spending delays that are seem to be inherent in infrastructure spending make it a very bad short run stimulus relative to consumption. Okay. So here are present discounted value integral multipliers, again, with respect to appropriations uh, up through five years. Later, I'm gonna show you in a table, uh, the long run multipliers. Um, the black line is government consumption. The blue is government investment with that exponent on public capital of 0 0.05, which has been my baseline. But now I'm going to show you what happens when the exponent of government capital is 0.1, so, so substantially higher, okay? In the neoclassical model, we see the really interesting wealth effects here. So if government capital is more productive in the production function, we get a smaller, or we get a smaller negative wealth effect. So labor supply doesn't go up so much. So we get a smaller multiplier in the short run, but then we get a larger multiplier as we get towards the longer run. And again, that's because that capital is building up. Um, and so then we're, we're having all the positive effects from there. In the new Keynesian model with no delays, there isn't that much difference. There's, you know, the orange line is slightly higher than the blue line, which is slightly higher than the black line. There isn't that much difference between government consumption or government investment of various productivities. Uh, once you put in the time to spend and build, the uh, government investment multipliers are, you know, zero or slightly below zero in the short run, and then only start catching up to the government consumption multipliers. Uh, for this particular uh, calibration of six quarter lag uh, when you get towards uh, five years. All right. So here are some long run multipliers from the simulated models. All right. So for government consumption neoclassical model, we have uh, 0.44 and with the Keynesian, new Keynesian model 0.89. All right, so those are the ones to think about for, for the lo longer run multipliers. If we have government investment with no delays and the theta G equal to 0 0.05, we get a uh, nice uh, neoclassical multi long run multiplier 1.3 and even higher for uh, the new Keynesian multiplier 1.8 in part because of that higher multiplier in the short run that the new Keynesian model gives you. If we raise government invest, the government investment productivity, the theta G, not surprisingly, we get even bigger multipliers. Now, once we put on the time to spend and time to build, that doesn't matter so much for the long run multipliers. You can see the differences with this present discounted value. Sure, it's you know, 2.1 versus 2.2 and 2.5 versus 2.8, but those aren't really important. Uh, and then, that's only because of what's happening in the short run. If we use the undiscounted integral, we're basically getting the same results. So delays do not matter much at all for the long run multipliers. It's only an aspect of those short run multipliers. Okay. Let me talk about the importance of the starting point. All right. So the size of the multiplier depends on whether the increase in government investment takes the economy towards or away from the socially optimal public capital stock. All right. In the baseline, neoclassical model implies the following social optimum for the ratio of uh, public capital <clears throat> and uh, government investment to output. And again, you have to be careful about 
not having too high a theta G or, or you actually won't have a, a, an optimum, uh, you know, if you allow increasing returns to scale to be too high. Uh, if given the calibration uh, that I have here for, for the beta and the delta, if theta G is 0 0.05, then uh, the optimal percent of government investment is 2.5, whereas if it's 0.1, it's five from the simple model. Okay. Now let's think about long run multipliers for different starting points. Okay, so let me, I wanna go through this relatively quickly. All right, so this is where we started at government investment to GDP ratio being 3.5%. And then I'm going to compare it to the multipliers where we start at a much lower level of public capital relative to GDP. So this really would matter a lot if we're thinking about developing economies, which might have less infrastructure versus an economy such as Japan, which might actually be above the social optimum. If there is an increase uh, in, let's just use the uh, present discounted one for new Keynesian. If, I'm sorry. But, yeah. um... Give me a hand in understanding why the multipliers are different based on the starting point. I would understand why optimal policies are different, right? You know, if I'm way below the efficiency yeah. of the state, then I want to get there faster right. as opposed to if I'm close to it. But the multiplier has nothing to do with optimal policies. It's an entirely different thing. Why is the multiplier itself different based the on where I start? Uh, because you're going away from an efficient point. I mean, there's an optimal, uh, another way to look at this is that there's an opt optimal uh, uh, ratio of the public capital to the private capital. And so if the government is just building more and more, say like some people argue Japan is doing, then, then you are reallocating re private resources to public resources away from the optimum, whereas uh, uh, this I understand, but yeah. this is a optimality point, not necessarily about the, where is the nonlinearity is my question, right? The, Mechanically, where is the nonlinearity that changes the multiplier based on the starting points? That's, well, but, that's my question. Well, part of it is because a multiplier is not an elasticity. So yeah. it's linear in the, in the logs but not in the levels and the multipliers and elasticity. So part of it is also simply if you're starting with less capital, whatever the, the uh, less public capital, whatever the, uh, the public, um, if you're starting with less public capital, whatever the social optimum is, your, your uh, elasticity is gonna be different in, in general equilibrium. And I'm gonna talk about general equilibrium elasticities in, in a few slides, which I should probably okay. get to. Okay. I, I guess is, is that the marginal product of um, government capital is much yes. higher when you're farther away from yes. socially optimal level of marginal, or, or yes. optimal level of government capital. That's my intuition. Yes. That's it. But but I, we could we could discuss more about this because there there is this other factor and that I realized afterwards and I haven't had a chance to uh, back out which is which. So so uh, okay. We can talk about that. All right, um, let's see. Okay, so generalizations that significantly affect the model results. So first of all, distortionary taxation significantly reduces the multipliers, at least the, the sorts of simulations that Lieber et al. ran. And, and in most cases, uh, the only time distortionary taxation doesn't uh, reduce short run multipliers is if there's an announcement that, that distortionary taxes are gonna rise in the future, then of course you can get higher multipliers from that. But, um, but in general, if, you're, if the taxation is coming in the short run, then uh, it will reduce the multipliers. Accommodative monetary policy can raise short run multipliers. And we know this from you know, much work, Conan et al, uh, for example. But also during a zero lower bound, time to build delays can actually raise multipliers. And this is related to Goethe Egertsen's expansionary effects of negative supply shocks. And Buakez, Guillard, Rouleau, Pasteloup have two really nice papers, one in red and the other one in JME, that talk about this. All right. So they take Leapers et al's idea of, you know, sure, there are these lags, time to build delays. But when you're at the zero lower bound, that works like a uh, negative supply, or works like a negative supply shock, which then under the ZLB leads to higher inflation and 
reduces real interest rates and therefore gives you higher multipliers, okay? I don't have time right now. I'm happy to talk about it in more general discussion. I am very skeptical of those kinds of effects uh, for various reasons. One is my uh, colleague Johannes Wieland's J JPE paper showing that the uh, earthquake and tsunami in Japan when they were at the ZLB was not expansionary. Um, so, but, I, but it's ne nevertheless a really interesting theoretical exercise. And I think, you know, I really like this paper, both of these papers, but, um, but I, I doubt that that channel is actually working. Um, let's talk about estimating the long run effects of government investment. So there are three main approaches. So we're now going to the empirics and I, I love all the questions, but um, I'm gonna jettison some, some of the stuff, but I do wanna talk about some of this. Um, there are three main approaches to trying to estimate the long run effects of government investment. One is time series. Uh, using time series aggregate data and ash hour and some of the ones we're talking about that there are country panels or cross sections so ilziki mendoza and vague and then also panels of industries or states and i don't know why of industries there a second time it looks now these ones that look at subnational uh ones you tend to be able to identify things better but the estimates you get are not aggregate estimates you typically have to uh, use a trade model to uh, then figure out what the aggregate implications are because of all the linkages and spillovers and business dealing effects across sub-regional units. So uh, as I say, identification is very challenging. I'm gonna talk about two things, the difference between the production function elasticity and the general equilibrium output elasticity and then endogenous public capital. So let's think about estimating the production function elasticity. That's that theta G, okay? So Ashour and Manel estimated uh, these. And in particular, they, in their baseline, ran ordinary least squares regressions of the log of GDP on a TFP, met, you know, a solar residual, uh, private capital, uh, private labor, and then put a measure of public capital there and estimated theta G. And Ashour found a theta G equals 0.39. Manel was 0.31 to 0.39. And this is what led him to argue that the productivity slowdown in the early 70s was because of the decline in infrastructure investment. Okay, now there have been a lot of work since then. That was, that was a rather controversial point. But um, Baum and uh, Lithgart's meta-analysis, which is a really nice uh, survey, settles on a value of theta G of 0 0.08 in the short run and 0 0.12 in the long run. And I'm gonna talk about some alternative estimates here. Now, there's also estimating general equilibrium output elasticities, or you can talk about multipliers, but most people talk about it as elasticity. So uh, Alfredo Pereira, who was my colleague at the time when he was doing this, and Flores de Frutos estimated long run elasticities from an SVAR. Now, the thing is that a VAR allows all variables to respond. So their elasticity includes the endogenous response of private investment, all right? So what you're, if you use a VAR or SVAR to uh, estimate the effect of a shock to government investment on output, you're actually, and then you look at the long run sort of parts of the, the impulse responses, you're actually estimating the steady state general equilibrium output elasticity of public capital. And I'm gonna call that epsilon SS, all right? Now they estimated it to be 0.63. And they were just using Cholesky decomposition kind of thing, all right? Now there's actually a link between the production function elasticity and the general equilibrium one. And that relationship is predicted by our uh, simple neoclassical model. So the, Steady state general equilibrium elasticity is related to that production function elasticity via this equation. And this omega here has in part the Hicks elasticity of labor supply, and it uh, has the depreciation rate in there that matters, and then the ratio of public capital to consumption, all right, that you, that, uh, from the initial start. The, um, now, what's interesting is if you take my baseline calibration, the neoclassical model, which was taken a large part from people like Leaper and all of that, then we get the following numbers for those uh, for that relationship. Now, remember that Ashour had estimated theta equal 0.39, 
If we plug theta equals 0.39 into this formula, we actually get an implied steady state general equilibrium elasticity of 0.63, which is exactly what Pereira Frutos <laughs> found, which is really interesting. And I did not do the calibration to get this result. I was just shocked when I saw it because I said, oh, how do, you know, I was trying to relate those two uh, elasticities. So the simple neoclassical model is just really helpful for sorting out kind of these various elasticities uh, from the literature. Now, the big problem is uh, the uh, endogenous capital. All right. Endogeneity occurs in part because wealthier economies invest in more public capital, and they should do that. A benevol benevolent social planner will respond to technological progress. Remember, that was my A, uh, by increasing the amount of public capital. Now, the earlier literature tried to deal with this by using lagged endogenous variables in instruments. We used to do that in the late 80s. You know, we now know that that's a bad idea. Uh, or Cholesky decompositions, which aren't great, but they're still, you know, the identification of last resort for macroeconomists and, you know, other techniques that are not ideal. Um, let me give you an illustration of the econometric problem using a DSGE Monte Carlo. That's what I mean there is I'm going to simulate uh, artificial data from a simple DSGE model and then uh, try to do ash hours type of estimation on it, okay? So I generalized the calibrated neoclassical model to allow the social planner to choose the optimal level of public capital. I used the baseline calibration of theta g equals 0.05. So that's the true theta g uh, in this model. And I allow technology to vary stochastically, all right? Now, if technology A goes up, then that raises the marginal product of public capital. So the optimal level of public capital should go up. So I'm going to focus on how steady state values of key variables change. All right. So the theoretical model implies that if you take a standard measure of TFP, say John Fernald's measure for uh, the US, that he actually ha he's capturing two things there. One is the true technology. But he, because he doesn't take into account public capital, he's also capturing this term. Now, suppose we regress the log of TFP on the log of public capital, all right? So I take, you say, Fernald's measure, which I'll do a little bit later, and regress it on public capital. Note that this air term contains the true technology. So now I'm going to construct log of TFP from this artificial data, doing it like Fernald does, um, you know, as log output minus the share weighted logs of private capital and labor. Then I'm going to regress that TFP on the uh, public capital, and that's going to give me an estimate of theta g, and I get a huge estimate, 0.64, which we know is well above the true value of 0.05. Thus, in a simple model where you have a benevolent social planner who's really adjusting, uh, the, that endogenous response to true technology results in significant upward bias in the estimated theta g, all right? consistent with the economic intuition. So how do we deal with that bias? Like I said, finding instruments is really hard at the aggregate level. I mean, somebody might be able to do it for some country. I have not come up with an idea for the US, but let's look at something that Buakez and his co-authors did using actual data, all right? So both of their papers were mostly simulated New Keynesian models, but there was a short discussion at the end of one of their papers where they present some independent empirical evidence using US aggregate data. They don't discuss endogeneity, but they say, quote, it's still important to account for the additional factors that may affect TFP in the long run, unquote, all right? They use Fernald's measure of TFP, but they also construct measures of the stock of R&D spending and the stock of human capital. Now, what's interesting is uh, Alfredo Pereira in that earlier paper, because we were all influenced by Granger and Engel, and as I said, he was in my department then, they couldn't find co-integration between public capital and TFP, you know, so they'd done everything in first differences. But Buakez find co-integration between the lar in the larger system of log TFP, log public capital, log R&D stock, and log human capital. So it sounds like they've captured the stochastic trends in TFP here by augmenting the system. This is not your work, but what is the frequency of this? This, I should know this because I estimated this, but it's been a while. I think that if they're using Fernald's measure, I suspect, you know, I actually though, I suspect that they must be using um, 
annual because public capital data is annual in the US. But with annual, TFP measurement is fairly crap, right? Because you're so much affected by labor hoarding and capital utilization. No, no, no. That, that's why they use Fernald's measure because his okay. is utilization so this, adjusted. Fine. Yes, yes. All right. Yeah, no, no, that's good. It, it, I'm glad you asked that question because everybody might not know that Fernald's measure is uh, utilization adjusted. All right. So by including these additional sources of TFP as control variables, I think they are reducing the upward bias in the regression. Now they're running things in levels. So they're estimating the co-integrating equation here. And they estimate theta G to be 0 0.065. All right, so much lower. Now, I was wondering, higher values. Well, the nice thing is all of their data and replication files were posted. So I downloaded them. I, you know, made sure that I could replicate their 0.065. It replicated perfectly. And then I reran the regression, uh, excluding the R&D and human capital. And I estimated a theta G equal 0.33, which was much more like what uh, had been estimated in the late 80s. So that just shows you, you know, another way, and this is with the data, all of that stuff that's stuck in the air term is what was biasing up those estimates of theta G earlier. This is a tricky question or a tricky finding in the sense that um, if you set your theta G to, you know, 0 0.06, but then not include r and human capital that will endogenously react to government investment, then yes. this time you'll be biasing the results in the other direction in, in, in a well, well Refit, great minds think alike because after my initial excitement, I then said, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, so the comparison, I mean, I think the comparison is just really useful with controls, without controls. We learn things from that. Their controls go far to diminish the upward bias due to social planner responses, but and I, I wasn't as quick as, as Refit was at figuring this out. It took me a few days uh, to say, wait a minute, Buakez's estimate may be downward biased since government investment is likely a key driver of both R&D and human capital. That public capital affects A in the stylized model, for example, so it is not appropriate to simply include these two endogenous variables as controls, right? You can, if there's an exogenous variable that was in your error term, you can deal with that by including it as a control. But if there's an endogenous variable in your error term, you can't do that. Bottom line, theta G, estimating theta G is difficult. I think that the Buakez estimate is probably downward bias. So at least we've got something. I think 0 0.065 might be a lower bound on what theta G is. Okay, so uh, just a quick review of empirical evidence on short run effects. I'm gonna uh, skip over some of these later slides. So my survey of the literature reveals scant empirical evidence that infrastructure spending has a short run stimulus effect. There are more papers that find negative effects on employment than positive effects in the short run. The uh, Obama stimulus results are particularly negative despite occurring during a period during a period when the economy was at the ZLB and the unemployment rate was nine to 10%. The negative effects of time to spend and time to build may explain the results that we're seeing in the empirical literature. So I'm going to zip over that. That's in the paper if you're interested. Let me just finish off by considering the question, is the US under investing in public capital? All right, so this shows uh, US government capital, public capital, but in the Bureau of Economic Analysis tables, it says pub, uh, government, as a percent of GDP. The blue line is total. Uh, the green line takes out defense spending, which is probably the uh, best way to do it if you're thinking of something going directly in a production function. And then the red shows transportation. Notice that I was really surprised by this, that, uh, and I should say these are current cost stocks ratios, um, that it looks you know, almost as high as some of the peaks before. However, something that it would look different if you allowed for the different uh, uh, deflators for each. And one of the big uh, themes at that infrastructure conference is that the relative price of investing in infrastructure has gone up dramatically, 
All right. So when you're looking at real stocks, you can you can get uh, different results from that. But just uh, you know, taking these particular numbers, suppose that uh, so here is Bureau of Economic Analysis data for 2018. But although um, if you did that, yeah. it would probably make the current number look relatively even higher than before. But not in real terms. I, I actually did some little experiments on this and, I'm, and, and it was a few months ago and I'm not remembering what it was, okay. but, but it's something to think about. Um, and okay. I've gone through the algebra. I, I, I reworked the model where there is a, um, again, the, the, the Greenwood, Herkowitz and Grissel trick about the, the coefficient in front of the investment. But in this case, it uh -huh. was government investment uh, where it doesn't turn as, as much and, and sort of looking you know, I must not have gotten something very clear because otherwise I would have remembered it usually, but, but I'll, I'll look at that again. <laughs> usually I remember things unless I'm not getting a clear answer on something. And I'll work on my basic algebra. <laughs> yeah, okay. The, um, so, so the actual, let's just focus here on government investment percent of GDP. So excluding that's uh, 2.6, all right? So if we think that theta G is the 0 0.05, then, we're at the, we were already at the optimum in 2018. If we think it's instead 0 0.065, what Buakez and them uh, had estimated, we should be higher up at 3.2. If we think theta G is 0.12, which was that long run uh, estimate that uh, uh, the meta-analysis had suggested, then that would say that um, we should be much higher, 6% of GDP. And I've just written down here the ratios of what the optimal amount should be. So uh, just some summary and conclusions. There are, there's a difference in the message about the short run versus the long run, right? So even when government investment has significant positive long run effects, the short run stimulus multipliers are less than those from government consumption in most cases. The effects of time to build and time to spend delays and the additional crowding out of private spending lead to this result. Now, if you believe in uh, expansionary effects of negative supply shocks at the zero lower bound, the Buakez paper, multipliers could be bigger for government investment. All right, so that's the, that's the exception. Long run multipliers in government investment depend critically on both the production function elasticity and on where the economy begins. Let me just, you know, I'd, I'd like to look more at this, not even just relative to the social optimum. It's just, are you starting out with lower ratio of, uh, GDP to uh, of public capital to GDP or a higher ratio, because it does matter for the actual multiplier. Now, estimating the production function elasticity is challenging. Uh, previous estimates of 0.39 are likely severely upward bias. I've shown you both DSG Monte Carlo evidence on that and some empirical evidence using the Buakez data. On the other hand, for the reasons that Refit gave about you know, using endogenous variables as controls, 0 0.065 may be a lower bound. So uh, lots of great work to be done in the future on government infrastructure, because there's a lot more that we need to know. All right, thanks. Super, um, one wonderful seminar. And it was uh, worth the effort to try to reel you in. Um, it still doesn't count, and we really want you here physically, but thank you so very much. Um, I guess we have a minute if anybody has a pressing question, and then um, Feather is going to have some office visits, and we should give her a bit of break before that. Well, very good. Thank you so very much um, from afar. We would have done this properly if you were here. But... Um, and and, and I appreciate, I, I know I'm probably standing in the way between people and their dinners. And so I really appreciate all your attention. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Looking forward to seeing you again. All right, bye-bye.